Hello, and welcome. I'm Daughter of Darkness, your narrator. Ventriloquism is not a modern art. It dates back to the ancient Greeks. Back then, the public thought that the practitioner of the art had the voice of the dead or the devil in their stomachs, and that's how they were able to make inanimate objects seemingly speak. So are ventriloquist dummies simply a time-honored form of entertainment? Or evil emissaries of Satan sent to torment you and devour your very soul? Have a listen to tonight's story, then decide for yourself. So sit back, relax, let me lead the way, and let's get scared together. You can think what you want, but I stand by this story being 100% true, and it was the most terrifying thing that's ever happened to me. When I was six years old, my family gave me a snail puppet, basically a glorified sock puppet with a long tube neck for my arm and a shell on the back. I named it Snaily, for obvious reasons. I got pretty good at making it talk and giving it expression, I really enjoyed it. The following year, on my seventh birthday, my grandparents gave me a Muppet. It was a gray furry one with a felt mouth and a stick attached to one arm. He became an extension of me, always on my hip and always cracking jokes. I loved it, and I was dreaming about becoming a ventriloquist when I grew up. My grandfather encouraged me, and he bought me a real ventriloquist dummy. It was a cheap knockoff of Charlie McCarthy, the dummy made famous by Edgar Bergen, and the puppet that all Hollywood dummies are based on. That doll was awesome to a seven-year-old budding ventriloquist like me. I didn't care that it was a cheap knockoff, that it only had a pull string to make him talk, that his velvet hat fell off his head every time I moved him. I loved him. Then, when my parents split up, for years, we bounced around splitting our time between my mother's home in Utah and my father's in Idaho. So in the final half of my fifth grade year, I moved back to Idaho, into my father's new home, and into the hellish nightmare that was the unfinished basement. That basement had a wide main hallway that led to two small bedrooms. The bedrooms had cement floors with no carpeting, and a little nook underneath the staircase opposite them. In the spring, water would flood the basement due to a faulty sub pump. Because of that, the entire place smelled of mildew and there was mold on the walls. So a good chunk of my life was spent breathing in the mold in my bedroom. Probably not the healthiest thing. When I moved in with my dad, I looked through the toys that he had been storing for me and found the Charlie puppet. By that time, I was nearly 11, and I had long forgotten about ventriloquism. But seeing Charlie again reignited that flame, and I was at it again. Until a couple of months later, when I got my first computer. Suddenly, learning DOS Basic was my new obsession. I cast Charlie into my moldy old closet and moved on to more adult things. Eventually, my father put him away in the storage shed outside, for safekeeping. From the moment I moved into that house, the basement was my greatest fear. When I found out my dad was sticking me into that dingy, unfinished basement bedroom with no carpet and mold on the walls, I pitched a fit. Not because it was gross, but because I was terrified of that entire space. The stairs were open-faced with no backing to them, so you could see into the small storage space underneath. I always felt like something was back there, waiting to grab my legs as I walked up the stairs. I used to book it up that stairs at top speed in hopes of avoiding that fate. The only light in the main room was a single bulb hanging on the end of a long wire. It wasn't designed to be like that, but the bulb was hanging from the mount that should have been attached to the ceiling. My father mounted it twice, but both times it fell down and was swinging within a week, so he just left it that way. There was also a wood-burning stove in the middle of the main room that needed to be fed every couple of hours during the winter to keep the house warm. 
Despite my terror of the basement, the job of feeding that fire fell on my scrawny little shoulders. So it was one day in the middle of winter, I was in the basement feeding the fire. Since moving in, I had been experiencing weird things, like hearing bumps in the night and having things fall off the shelves when nobody was near it, things like that. However, this was the first time that something truly terrifying happened to me. As I was feeding wood into the fire, I heard a deep guttural growl coming from below the stairs to my right. I froze. Then I closed the door to the stove and slowly turned to look at the stairs. As I did, right behind me, I heard a male voice say, I will kill you whispered in a deep voice. I lost it and ran screaming up the stairs. I think I only touched three of the 13 steps on the way up. I ran to the back of the house and huddled under some blankets, crying. I never wanted to go back to that basement again, but eventually I had to go back down to my room. From that point on, though, every little sound had me on edge when I was down there. As time passed, though, I was able to convince myself that I imagined the whole thing, and I went back to living with just a general fear of the basement, until another day when I was feeding the fire. A sense of dread came over me, nothing that I could put my finger on, but it got my pulse racing. I went running up the stairs and was nearly to the top when the one thing that I had always feared would happen, happened something grabbed my legs from underneath the stairs and wrapped its fingers around my ankles. I was so scared that I got lightheaded. I couldn't figure out what was happening. Was it real or a dream? As I tried to twist away from the fingers, I fell backwards. I didn't hit a single step on the way down, just landed flat on my back on solid concrete. I felt the wind get knocked out of my lungs, and then I passed out. I don't know if it was from the impact or the fear. I just know I lost consciousness. I also don't know how long I was out, but when I came to, my head hurt more than it had ever hurt in my life, and I felt dizzy, not fully aware of my surroundings. I had to crawl up the stairs to the main part of the house. Then I laid down on the couch and fell asleep. My dad got home a few hours later and woke me up. I told him what happened, and he looked me over for any serious injuries before telling me that I must have had a dream. I was tired and lethargic for a few days after that, but eventually I felt normal again, and I ended up deciding that it had been a dream. Stuff like that just doesn't happen in real life. Thinking back now, I must have suffered a head injury and should have gone to the hospital, but my dad was very much the walk it off type of guy. My brother was very aware of my fear of the basement, and he would torment me as much as possible, jumping out from behind walls to scare me, or sending me down to get things from the basement, just because he knew I was afraid. The worst thing he did, though, was to move stuff around in my room at night. My room didn't have a door, so it was pretty easy to sneak in and move stuff around while I was sleeping. He would put my toy chest in front of the doorway, or turn my desk upside down and put my chair on top of it. There was never anything subtle about it. I didn't want to fuel his behavior or give it any attention, so I never got upset or even mentioned it to him. I just put everything back the way it was and ignored it. My mom always told me that he would just grow tired of his pranks if he knew they weren't working. It was old school, don't feed the trolls. So eventually it stopped. Or so I thought. One night, my brother's prankster spirit came out in full force. I woke up to a loud knock on my closet wall. I looked over, and in the dim of the nightlight, I could see my ventriloquist dummy Charlie sitting on top of the toy chest, facing me. I let out a little nervous laugh. Charlie had been put away in a garbage bag with the other toys that I no longer used and that bag was stored in the shed, in the backyard. I was sort of proud of my brother for the effort. 
This had a lot more subtlety in class than his usual pranks, but I ignored it and fell back to sleep. A while later, I was awoken again by another knock, and I sat up hoping to catch my brother in the act. This time, Charlie was on the floor, sitting upright and facing my bed. I rolled my eyes and let out a long sigh. I respected my brother's conviction to the prank, but I was a little too tired to deal with it. So again, I rolled over and went back to sleep. For a third time, I awoke to a knock. This time, the doll was again sitting on top of my toy chest. But this time, I flipped out and I ran into my brother's room, telling him that I was tired and he needed to stop messing with me. The only problem was, his room was empty. It slowly dawned on me that he hadn't been home all day. He had been spending the night at his friend Nick's house. I had been alone in the basement all night. It was quite some time later that I discovered that my brother had never moved anything in my room at all, ever. In fact, by all accounts, he did everything possible to avoid going into my room because he said it gave him the creeps. I felt like I was going insane. I couldn't fathom how that doll ended up sitting on my toy chest or how it even got inside the house in the first place. I ran upstairs, crying uncontrollably. My dad's door was locked, so I fell asleep on the couch. The next day, I woke up and it felt like it had all been a dream. But dream or not, I was done with the basement. I started sleeping on the pull-out couch every night after that. I don't remember the story I told my dad. Something about being bothered by the mold, I think but I never slept in that room again. Luck was on my side, and the basement started to flood heavily over the next few months, so my dad eventually moved me to an upstairs room. I thought my troubles were over, but that was just the beginning of a nightmare that was to span almost a decade of my life. At this point, I should explain a little bit about how this particular doll looked. Here's a photo I found online of the authentic Charlie McCarthy doll on the left, and then there's the knockoff Charlie doll on the right, like the one I had. As you can see, he had a hard-molded plastic head and hands, and his right eye had a slot carved out to hold a plastic monocle. I lost that monocle pretty early on, though. He also had a felt hat that got beaten up pretty quickly by me, so it was misshapen. His jacket could be removed and his whole torso and arms were made of white cotton. The elbows were just a length of tubing divided by a thread to make it look like he had elbows. And the painted hair on my Charlie doll had worn off a patch in the back, showing the flesh-colored plastic through the paint. He had two plastic shoes that you could take on and off and could tie, but I had lost one years earlier. Inside the other one, I had painted two letters with white paint. The letters were parts of my last name, so I won't divulge what they were, but they were distinct and very much support my claim that Toy Story was a ripoff of my life as it came out two years after the events of this story. The last important detail was that it had a braided nylon loop sticking out of the base of the neck. When you pulled the string, the mouth would open and close. I hate that doll now with a burning passion and looking at it makes me sick to my stomach. As I said, after Charlie showed up in the basement, I refused to sleep down there ever again. And that was the first time that I ever stood up to my father about anything. He did try to force me to stay in the basement again, but I'd wait until he was asleep, then I'd sneak up into the den. He'd get up for work every day and find me sleeping on the couch. Eventually, he stopped trying to make me go back down there. It was summer by this time. I slept in the den the entire summer, but my dad didn't like the idea of me sleeping on the couch all the time. So eventually, he moved my bed and toys into my sister's room. When he did that, I asked him to put Charlie back in the shed. I watched my dad put Charlie in a plastic bag with all my other dolls and puppets from my younger years. He wasn't pleased about it, though, 
saying that I was being dumb and I needed to just grow up. Because my sister was only eight, she had a very early bedtime. I would read with a flashlight in bed at night so as not to wake her up. Well, one night before school started, I was sleeping soundly on my back when I felt a weight on my chest. It was heavy and there were odd angles to it pressing into me. At first I thought it was my dog, a 40 pound Springer Spaniel, but it felt wrong, too small to be my dog. Some may think it was sleep paralysis, but I started flailing around immediately, so there was no paralysis involved. When I opened my mouth to scream, something hard and plastic shot into my mouth and pressed into the back of my throat. I flailed around, choking and grabbing at the thing on my chest, but it felt weird, like it was covered in cloth. It had a lot of give, but it was firm and pretty heavy for something so small. The top of it was round plastic, and I kept trying to push it off, but it wasn't moving, and it prevented me from rolling on my side. I was barely able to breathe. In my wild attempt to get this thing off of me, my hand latched onto a part of it that was hanging off the main mass, a single string at the base of the hard plastic on top. That's when I realized what it was. It was Charlie. The weight of him on my chest was like someone had filled him with lead instead of cotton, and his hand was down my throat, making me gag. Oddly though, realizing what it was helped me panic less. I felt like I just needed to see him. I needed to make sure it was real, I guess. So I fumbled around in the dark, and I grabbed the flashlight that I used for reading, and I turned it on. The second there was light in the room, the doll was just that again a doll. He slumped off my chest and I pulled the wet cotton arm and plastic hand out of my mouth. I stared at it, coughing and crying and scared as hell. I had realized earlier that summer that no one in my house cared about what was happening to me and that I had nowhere to turn. I simply sat in bed with my flashlight illuminating that damn doll, something I used to love and now despised. I don't know how long I sat there, but by the time the batteries died on my flashlight, the sun was coming up. I never fell back asleep again that night. That's how I know for sure that this wasn't a dream. Well, that and the other nightmarish things that happened involving that doll. That day, after my father left for work, I took out my frustrations on Charlie. I took him outside, smashed his face in, kicked him, swung him around, and smashed him against the porch beams. I was working some stuff out, okay? After that, I took him back to the shed, and I saw that the bag that he had been in had a hole in it about the size of his head. So I wasn't going to take any more chances. I put him in the toy chest that was in the shed. It was square, with Ninja Turtles painted all over it, and the lid had a lock. I shoved him in there and locked the lid, declaring victory. That actually worked for a while. I didn't see him for the rest of the summer. The last time I saw Charlie in Idaho was after school started. I came home from school one day with my girlfriend, or as much of a girlfriend as one can have at 11 years of age. She was a cool kid and I really liked her, but this would be the last time we ever hung out. We got to my house and dumped our backpacks on the floor by the front door and sat down to watch Star Trek The Next Generation. It was part of why we were friends. She loved Star Trek and so did I. We watched it together every afternoon until her mom came to pick her up. It should be noted that while we couldn't see our backpacks from where we were sitting on the couch, the only way for someone else to get to them would be to pass right in front of us, in between us and the TV set, so it would have been kind of hard to sneak past us. Well, halfway through the episode, our backpacks flew across the room. They didn't roll or slide. They passed right in front of the TV in the air, like someone had launched them hard. She screamed, and I screamed. We ran over to the bags, and then we looked back from where they came. Sitting there against the door, with a smug air about him, was Charlie. It was like he was taunting me. 
My mind was racing, and I decided the only thing that I could do was make sure he was gone forever. Now an adult would think, burn it. But I was a sixth grader. Fire wasn't on the menu. I decided to bury him, and I roped my girlfriend into helping me. She was scared and confused, but eventually she did help. I got my dad's shovel, and we took Charlie into the woods behind my house. We dug a three-foot hole and threw him in. After I covered it up with dirt, I put two sticks in there forming a cross, and then I covered that with a mound of pine needles. And that was that. I never told anyone about it, and as far as I know, she didn't either. But she did break up with me that day. The next summer, I moved to Utah to my mom's house, and I never looked back at Charlie or that house in Idaho again. So, fast forward. I grew up and moved to California for high school, and I met a girl and fell in love, as one does. Eventually, my dad moved out to California, too, to be closer to the kids that he used to neglect, and he brought with him all the things that we had left behind, hoping that we would equate nostalgia with love. He gave me my Ninja Turtle toy chest, but Charlie wasn't in it any longer. Two years passed, and it was now January of 2000. I had dropped out of school the year before, so I was working at McDonald's, taking every shift that I could. Things were kind of growing stale between me and my girlfriend, Angela. She was actually kind of mean, to be honest. But she was hot and I was fat, and I didn't think I could do any better. One day, after a morning shift at work, I came home and Angela was waiting on my porch. She knew I would be home alone, and she wanted to do that thing that teenagers like to do when they can be alone together. Even though I was beginning to dislike her, I was 17 years old. Need I say more? We went into my room and I told her I was going to take a shower to get the McDonald's grease off me first, when she asked me why my bed was so dirty. I turned to look, and on my bed was a small set of sticks, crossed, underneath a pile of pine needles. To me that made no sense. There were no pine needles anywhere near my house. Also, although I'm sure you've made the connection already, at that time, I hadn't. I simply commented about how weird it was, brushed them all onto the floor, and did what we came to do. Afterwards, as we were sitting there talking, she said something about not knowing that I had such a cool-looking doll. I followed her gaze, and sitting right on top of my Ninja Turtle toy box was dear old Charlie. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. I was not smooth about this at all. I screamed like a little girl, felt dizzy, started hyperventilating, and really thought I was going to pass out as a ton of thoughts came crashing down on me all at once. The weirdest thing, though, is that this doll was perfectly clean and intact. He still had the jacket that I had lost long ago, and his hat was perfect and he still had the monocle and both shoes. Angela couldn't understand why I was freaking out so hard. I asked her to check the inside of the shoes and tell me if she saw anything. She went over, took the shoes off and looked inside, and she found the white paint with the special mark for my last name. I ran over and grabbed Charlie. As I picked him up, it finally dawned on me what the pine needles meant. I spun around to look next to the bed where they had been swept off. There was nothing on my floor now. I told Angela all about it, and she was finally understanding why I was so upset. I checked that doll all over. He had the same bald spot, everything. This wasn't just a similar doll. This was him. This was my Charlie. Angela wanted to know the whole story. So I explained it to her, over my Weber grill. That day I learned that plastic stinks when it burns, and it leaves a residue at the bottom of a charcoal grill. I also learned I wasn't as crazy as I thought, because as he burned, we both swore he was screaming. A part of me wants to think that it was just air escaping from the head as it melted, 
but I don't think that's the truth. Anyway, once Charlie was barbecued, I haven't seen him since. So, have you decided yet? Is the ventriloquist dummy just a harmless tool for entertainment? Or Satan's plaything? I vote for Satan's plaything. Put your vote down in the comments section below. And if you enjoyed tonight's story, give it a thumbs up. Thank you so much for listening tonight and for your continued support. It means the world to me to entertain you here every Thursday at 5 p.m. It truly is a party every week when you're here. So, until next time, stay scared, my friends, and eat lots of Halloween candy. <laughs>